Hello, hello, construction professionals. Welcome to the podcast where we flip the script on what it means to live, breathe, and lead construction today. In this podcast series, we unpack how great construction can really be when you lead with humanity, put people first, and drop the bullshit of the way it's always been done. Our world has changed, our conversations have changed, and it's time construction catches up. Hey, this is everybody. Thought I'd take a moment. I've had a lot of questions coming back and forth from our audience saying, Jonathan, what is it that you utilize in your routines that keep you on track and help you show up the way you choose to show up in life? So I thought I'd share products that work for me. And if they serve you well, awesome high five, then job well done. It'd be selfish of me not to share something that works so wholeheartedly. I'm sharing with you two products I use, the five minute journal, literally every morning and in the evening, it, it's a prompt. It's one of the tools I use. There are other platforms I use, but this makes it simple on some of the days that it's tougher. There are prompts in it, gratitude, achievements for the day, what you're proud of. Like this is doing the hard work for yourself. The other tool here, productivity planner, this gets utilized usually in the evening or in the morning of like it identifies the one, two, and three tasks that you really want to achieve. It's so easy to have a, a long to-do list that gets heavy, hard, and really tough to navigate. Pick one thing. If you do one thing, then everything else becomes a bonus. These are the tools, Intelligent Change products. The link will be in the description. Go to intelligentchange.com. If they serve you well, if it's something you want to be a part of, save yourself a few bucks. Use Jonathan10 as the code. Jonathan10, save yourself 10%. These things are cool. They work for me. They'll work for you. If they serve you well, if this is the right time in life, then I encourage you to give it a shot. Jonathan 10. Alisa, welcome to the show. Thanks for making time to be here. Thank you. Nice prior to, to prior to push and record, we're sort of just, just um, chit chatting a little bit. And one thing we we're talking about is, you know, women leading the way. And that's one of the main reasons you're here today. You're up to big things. These conversations need to happen more frequently than not. RSG. Road safety. We're not talking a small organization here. We're talking, we're up to big things. We're doing great work. We're doing a lot of work. And it takes a lot of courage, confidence, and bravery to be in the role you're doing, to be in the industry you're, you're in, and to lead people. So, you know, the first thing buzzing through my mind is truly, truly, this is, this is not, in, in a world where you can choose any industry, any organization, any pathway. You get into construction, like, let's just, let's get right into it. Why construction? So, I, I mean, I do, I get asked that question a lot. I didn't actually pick the industry. I picked the um, organization. And I think that that's really important. I do talk to um, a lot of groups and a lot of women. Um, and really what I say is, um, I, I certainly would never have picked construction if I could have picked an industry that was more aligned to the direction that I wanted to go. But I'm really excited that I actually ended up here because it is an old boys archaic industry and it really does need to change. And if you look at the direction that construction's taking, um, we will not have any skilled trades or laborers if we continue down this, this path that we're going. So it's awesome to be part of this journey and, and this change. Um, but to answer your original question, I actually picked the company and the, um, the ownership. And, and one of the things that's very important to me is there has to be um, a relationship or a trust. You have to, it's interesting. I'm going to digress a lot. So just stop. Yeah, yeah, this is awesome. You want me to come back. Um, so I'm also the president of the Canadian Women in Construction, KWIC. And they asked me, when they asked me to be president, I said, make sure you want me to be president. I'm, you have to like my style and my style is very direct and I get things done and I don't listen to the bullshit. Oh, I Sorry, I, I actually swear a lot, so let me... I, tell this me. podcast is all about being real, raw, and authentic, and swearing is, is very much okay. common practice. Okay, so uh, I'm trying hard not to. The more I speak, because I, I know it offends people, I usually start my uh, any session that with... I, it, it, what happens, I'm very passionate about what I'm doing, so sometimes it just it just falls out. Um, so And I'm, it's not meant to um, insult or... or um, offend anybody, but I, I do, right. I, I feel like I need a disclaimer when I go places. Um, but I was saying to, to the, the, this all women board, make sure you want me to be president. I, I, I have a certain style. I'm very direct. Obviously I swear now, 
um, um, I, I really get things done and sometimes that's not what everybody wants, particularly in a leader. So to come back to my original company, so I was hired with Powell Contracting and it's one of the companies under the RSG umbrella now. Um, and I was hired as a controller, that's my background is finance. Um, but I've always worked in entrepreneurial companies and I've always had a role that's been a dual role. It's always been a controller position or a VP finance working with the entrepreneur or the business owner. Um, and so that's really what drew me here. Little did I know that, uh, you know, I, we would have this exponential growth and, uh, and I'd be here today. It's interesting. I just finished uh, reading this book called Rocket Fuel and it talks about the visionary and the integrator. And if you meet um, uh, Bill Powell, who's actually the owner of, uh, but he's one of the owners, there's, there's four actually, um, but he's one I work the closest with. Um, and and you, I can see now that the reason that, one of the reasons that we're very successful, obviously the, the main reason is your, your employees, um, but that we work really, really well together. And I would say he's the visionary and I'm the integrator. So I can actually um, see where he wants to go and, and how we actually put all those pieces together in order for us to be successful. So that really is the key and, and construction just happened to be the industry that he's in. That was an amazing answer to a, a question that went everywhere and, and super exciting. So there's so many different things that jumped out at me, right? I love that. And this is what, folks, this is, this is it, right? Nobody gives a shit about the industry. You work for great people. You're around great people. You can work for, for you know, I'm going to say this loosely, the best construction organization out there measured by a metric of financial growth, but they're a piece of shit people to work for. So it's not sustainable. It's not going to be around very long. <laughs> Instead, I love where you pivoted to. It's like, hey, why construction? And it wasn't construction. It was you connected with great people. Yeah. Right? You connected with people. great people. And I tell people when I talk about it, I said the thing is, is we're because this industry is so difficult for women, and it is starting to change, but because it's so difficult, you have to work in an organization, one that's aligned to your core values, because you won't be successful. And we call it now a uh, sponsorship. You need someone to sponsor you. You need someone that's going to take you out, introduce you to people, um, vouch for you. That's hugely, hugely important now in, in any industry, but particularly in our industry. And so if that, if you don't have those, you're, it doesn't matter um, how great you are, what kind of leader you are, um, it, it, it makes no difference. You will not, be, I, that's my personal opinion, you will not be successful. You need all of these pieces in order for you to be, to get to where I am today without all those pieces in place. Um, it, it just, it, it just can't happen. Or I think that there's just so many things against you that it becomes so difficult that you actually give up. And that's why I talk a lot about, you know, I, and I, I call we, we're blazing trails. I understand that I'm blazing trails, but we have to do this together. We have to blaze, I say it all the time, one trail one big fucking trail that we all follow, one voice, we all go together, we're unified, and then everybody that's coming up behind us has this path to follow. Because what's happening now is, and it's starting to change, but we're really at the beginning of it, is everybody wants you to blaze your own trail. Do you know how difficult it was for me to get here? All the hardships that I had to go through, um, and everybody wants you to do the same thing because they don't want it. To, they don't want you to be where I am today, and, and, and I blaze this trail, and it's very easy to get to, to where I am. People want you to, to feel that pain that they went through to get to this position. And that's really what I'd like to change to say, we're only going to make an, an impact in this industry is if we have women in leadership positions, if we have women superintendents, we have women for people, um, that's going to be the change that we need. And we can only do that if we are inclusive, um, but also that we show women that, it, that it's okay to be here and that we're supportive of one another and that you don't have to do this on your own. Okay, there is a lot there. And I love it, right? Because you're challenging the status quo. I want to go back to something. And this, I think, for me, ties in. You had said something that, that piqued my interest earlier on in the conversation where you said, you know, it's an old boys club. True, right? Construction is very much an old, old boys club. And anybody who says, you know, you guys are full of shit, I, I challenge you to give your head a shake. Like, look, it's an old boys club. There's nothing about that. There's, not, there's nothing to hide about that. And, you know, the comment was, Hey, if it stays like this, isn't going to stick around for very long. Interesting, right? I want to know more about that. And then you know, you you talked about so. Actually, let's stop. Let's stop there. What do you mean by that when you say if, if it stays the way it is, it's not going to be around very long? What do you mean? Well, if you look at, at the stats for the labor force for construction, I think it's eighty thousand people are going to retire in the next five years, um, and we don't have. The, 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 we have to change the narrative for construction. What, was, what it used to be was 
Um, if you didn't have an education, this was the the the, yeah. the industry to be in, and that's and that's just not true. Um, and that's the narrative that needs to change. If if, if we're skilled trades, if you want to be in, we're so if I'm, I'll, I won't talk specific my industry because we're road builders, um, but in the construction industry in general, if you look at carpenters, welders, electricians, um, plumbers, any kind of these skilled trades, the one thing is is now, not only do you have to, first of all, you're going to make good money. You're part of a union. You'll have benefits. They have good pension plans now. So it's a good paying job. Um, the other part is for some of these trades, you can actually start your own business. And so if you want to be an entrepreneur, this is a great, right. a great way to get in, get trained, um, you know, have a little bit of, of, of um, you know, guidance and advice. And you can now meet people in the industry. You can meet uh, potential customers. So I, I think that's the kind of the narrative that we need to change. But you can see all of our skilled trades, all of our laborers, it's an aging population, it's an aging workforce for us. So at some point, they're all going to retire and we don't have anybody, this younger generation coming up. And we tried, they tried to get women, uh, or that's what we're trying to do. If you look at Ford, uh, it's just announced, I think 3.6 million for women in construction to be able to look at paid apprenticeship programs. If you look at our stats, um, we're the women in the skilled trades, I believe it's like 5%. And, uh, and that's pretty standard actually globally. I'm part of the, um, the KWIC, the, we're the, I'm the Canadian representative or KWIC, the, I'm, I'm the representative for the, um, it's, it's name it, which is the national women in construction global partners. So I've met now women with, for, um, women in construction associations from, um, Australia, New Zealand, England. Um, South Africa, Qatar, Dubai, um, and we all have the same issues. I mean, some of them have bigger issues than us, but we all have the same issues. And that is uh, pay equity, job title equity, uh, women, this, we have the same stats for women in construction. Um, we also, it's about women, um, is childcare, that's another really big issue. I don't have any of those answers, um, but that is really one of the big, big issues. But when I looked at the stats in Canada, Alberta has a higher percentage of women in the skilled trades. And if you look back, what they did is they went back to, it was government, industry, unions, education, they all got together and they, they put in these paid apprenticeship programs, they promoted it, and that's why they have higher women, a higher women percentage. So it looks like Ontario is starting to do something similar, which is exactly what we need. And we talk about this globally, that that is our first step to get women in. The second, the problem that happens is you get women in and then there's still just discrimination, harassment, um, and it's rampant so that now you get them in, but they, they're, just, they're just not going to stay. The other part that women are facing is, particularly in the trades, is, is although and it's difficult to say now because I don't feel like women are the primary caregivers of children anymore because just our, our things have changed. We have blended families, same sex uh, families. Um, you have, um, you know, you also have aging parents. So I, I feel like the roles are a little bit more split between the women and men, but women still, t they still take time off if their children are sick mm -hmm. um, or they have appointments or, or whatever happens. And they still, I think it's, the, I can't remember what the percentage is, but they still get disciplined based on that one, whereas the men don't. So now you're looking at how do you balance your life and, 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 and a, a, a job in the trades that isn't quite um, open to this flexibility that we need. But if I talk about my industry, specifically road building, it's difficult for the crews for people to not be part of it. So you have four or five people teams. And then if you have one person that's not available, um, it makes it difficult. So I understand sure. that how, how do we ask, how do we, how do we work around that? How do we schedule that? Or for us, we work in the evenings um, because that's based on road closures. So it's not like you can start early or, or leave, or leave early or start late. Um, you have to stick within the times that are that are allotted to us. So again, I don't have all the answers, but I do know that some of the trades they have flexibility that you can actually either and, and you can read about a lot of women that are in skilled trades that actually say things like my again, it goes back to your employer. My employer was very supportive. Uh, my crew was very supportive. They knew someday I had to be off the site at two thirty to go pick up my child, and that that was successful. So we either look at child, oops, sorry child care options for us so that, um, you know, you can drop your kids off to a construction childcare that runs all hours, um, or we need to figure out ways within our industry to be able to be more inclusive to 
and it doesn't have to be women. It's people with um, children. Yeah, you know, the thing that, thank you for going into that, because the thing that sort of buzzes around in my brain to summarize it all up is show up as a damn human being. Yeah. Have some empathy and compassion. Yeah, exactly. You said a couple of different things, right? Hey, you know, if somebody doesn't show up to site, man, woman, or, or you know, it doesn't matter. When, it, when somebody doesn't show up to site, yes, it impacts everybody. Well, the old traditional way is if you're not going to show up, don't bother coming tomorrow. Well, that doesn't serve anybody well. How about showing up as a human being and say, is everything cool? How can we be supportive? And then actually give a shit and pivot around it. Right? And, and construction has the highest suicide rate and they attribute it to mental health. And, and which doesn't get talked about, which pisses me. Sorry. That's, that's something that pisses me off. And I've talked about it in the past and I'm going to talk about it for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we turn a blind eye. Unfortunately, shit happens on site and it gets covered up like you wouldn't believe. Fortunately, we're having rough conversations to, to illuminate that. So thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but there you, you, you yeah. struck a chord with me there. No, and, and I think that that's what, that's what we have to talk about is it's not only women in construction. There's a, there, you know, and, and mental health is a real thing. I think we, we felt it, uh, um, you know, I don't know, a hundred times worse through COVID. And so when people didn't have access to resources and, or programs that were in place and we, construction has a high addiction um, uh, percentage as well. So, we have to be open and flexible and uh, and accommodating. And so, and, and, and we're getting there. I'm not saying that everyone's turning a blind eye, but look, these are, I think, the tough conversations that we need, need to have. And I do feel like if you get women into these superintendent and four people uh, positions, that you show that uh, empathy and, and you can see how different people lead. And then what happens is it changes that narrative on the job site. So what is acceptable or not acceptable? When we started our DEI committee, um, and I think we're probably, it's our third year now. And one of the first things that we did as a committee, we're sitting around this group of people feeling, okay, like, what, where do we start? What do we do? How does this work? Yeah. Um, and, and it was funny because one of the things that we agreed on was we just needed to be educated. And so it just, lucky for us, one of our committee, committee's members, her partner is a teacher in the, um, is, a, is a high school, I think she's a high school teacher. Anyway, she's in the, the public system and she had, um, had give us, got us this contact with uh, Garrett and he's a, he's a teacher in um, alternative, he was an alternative school teacher. He's now with the union and he does these equity, we call it, we call it equity 101. So he, he's done all of our training for, for my, uh, my group of companies. And I'm actually going to engage him to run this through KWIC because th this was to me um, life changing. So we go through the equity 101 training and it was a two, two day, full on two days and uh, this is where I learned just how much we don't know about one another and we don't know mm. about diversity, equity and inclusion. And that I really believe that DEI is a journey. It's not a destination. And every day I'm learning. I said now I would introduce myself as Lisa Larone. My pronouns are she, her. And now I actually say Lisa Larone. My pronouns are she, her, they. Because I understand now that saying uh, or identifying with they means you're being more inclusive to people that don't want to identify um, as she, her, he, him. Which is... Mm. Um, which. For me, I know, again, these are personal um, commitments from my, my, my standpoint, but that's just very important. If I didn't go through some of this training, I would never know that. Or if I wasn't continually trying to be educated or learn, I would never know some of the things that are happening. And I know it's, a, it's not always easy, but I always talk from my personal experience when I was approached to say, did I have nine women that could uh, participate in a senior leadership? And I was very excited. I said, absolutely, I do. And then she said to me, how many of them are white? And they were all white. So, then I, so now I tell people, look, and I'm an advocate for women and diversity and equity and inclusion, but I have my own unconscious biases. So we have to recognize that. And then that's how we can change things. If we don't recognize it, that we're, we're not perfect and that we do hire people that look like us, talk like us, act like us, walk like us, then we'll, we'll never change that. Women will only apply for jobs if they feel like they, they possess all the skills that are on the application. So you, if when I hear this a lot, we hire the best person for the job. And I'm like, you don't because people aren't applying for the jobs and they're not applying for the jobs or particularly women, because if they don't feel like they check all these boxes, they just don't apply. So if you change the wording with how you put your job ad, ad, uh, advertisements up, then you're now, now you're going to get more people um, applying. One of our uh, members on our DI committee is from South Korea. And he actually said uh, when he was applying for jobs, he wasn't getting any interviews at all. Nice young guy. And uh, his buddy said to him, put, put an English name on there. Don't put your 
<clears throat> your birth name. He said, what? So he put his English name on there. We actually interviewed him, hired him. I, I'm hoping that that's not because he had an English name, but maybe that's the reason why. But I tell that story is how sad is that, that you, that, that, that who's ever, you know, reviewing or uh, screening the, the um, resumes, just, you, you just get left out. And I use this example often because we have companies in the U.S. Again, they hire the best person for the job. And I'll say, if this one says John McDonald and this one says Amir, you know, Halababa, you're, what are you gonna, I don't care whether the, the, yep. Um, yep. the you have exactly the same qualifications. Un unconsciously, you're going to pick John McDonald. I can just tell you that that's, and he's like, yeah, you're right. You're yeah, this is real, that. right? The, the unconscious yeah. biases and how many times does it happen? Look, we, I think it's, it's talked about in certain organizations, but it's talked about in a different thing. The, the, the word that's thrown around, does it fit the culture? Yeah, but when you say does it fit the culture, what they really mean, you know, if it's a European background in the construction, and let's just say, let's assume it is in this case. Okay, if, if it's a whole bunch of Italians and Portuguese and, and other Europeans, do they fit the culture? And what, what the unconscious bias is actually suggesting in that scenario is, are, are we like-minded? Are we going to think the same? Do we look the same? Do we eat the same? Do we talk the same? And what you're coming up with, what you're illuminating is, all right, folks, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's have the self-awareness. You've demonstrated a huge self awareness. Say, hey, I have my own so um, you know unconscious biases that I need to acknowledge, right? <laughs> and yes. if I, the other thing that you, you talked about is, you only know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. And how do you get? How do you pivot past what you don't know? What you don't know, you continually educate yourself. You talked about Garrett and sitting in there, you know. I don't know what that experience is like, and one day, you know, uh, I, I look forward to experience that. The, the way I, when I looked at your body language and your tonality and the way you were discussing it, it was almost like your, your chest is ripped open and your, your, your full authentic self is exposed and saying, holy shit, I didn't know, I didn't know this. And now that I do, I'm showing up as a better human being, as a better leader with more self-awareness to actually communicate to our team, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And the, the pronouns, we, when we started, and, and one of the things that Garrett, the, the one thing that stuck to me for this very first training, we'd done renovations prior to do, getting our DEI committee, and we went with this whole open concept, and we talked about having an all-gender washroom. And then we looked at the mm. price, it was, I don't know, it was too expensive, whatever, I can't remember what the price was at the time, but we'd made this decision, it, it wasn't worth it for us. So then I go through this training, and now I find out, and I, I, I don't, we, I'm trying to back up his stats, so I don't know whether um, it's, it's, it's true, but it, in, it, to me, it made sense. So I'm, I'm, I, I continually talk about it. But he said one of the main industries for transgender men is construction. And logically, mm -hmm. that just makes sense to me. But, but he said, can you imagine now going to work every day and not having a safe place to go to the washroom? And then because he, he talked about, you know, transgender people transitioning, um, just, you know, wh where do they go? Which washroom do you choose? Just things that never uh, impacted my life. Right. So, I, right. so I had no idea. It was the same, same thing, just being ignorant of what's going on. And I was thinking, could you imagine, and now I'm thinking just my personal um, perspective, if the only place I could go to the bathroom was was a urinal, like that was that was it. I had no other options. And so I started to think, oh, you know what? This, why would we make this decision, a financial decision, when and and, I, and I'll go back. We made the financial decision because it didn't impact me. But if I had this um, a, a, a diverse work group, I would have been getting different perspectives. And because we didn't at the time, everybody was basically like-minded. And one of the first things we did after our equity one-on-one training was we have an all-gender washroom and we actually have a quiet area uh, or a prayer room. Because the other thing we found out was some of our Muslims were praying um, on the washroom floors. And, uh, and I just felt like that. I, the other thing for us is we didn't, when we did this open concept, um, there's no, there's no privacy anymore. Um, because of everything, although even if you have an office, there's, they're all windowed. Um, so you, you're also not thinking about that. Um, so now we have this, we call it, we call it the quiet room where if you need to, uh, pump, if you're breast, breastfeeding and you're back at work, or you just need a mental health break, or you need an, op an option to, uh, to pray, which is a nice clean room. Um, and so it actually, and when we first started this, the backlash that we got was quite funny from oh, the yeah. washroom, which was hysterical, <laughs> as well as this quiet room. And, and now uh, the amount of comments I've received back about the private room or the quiet room with just things like, you know, when I had to take a call from my family um, right. and I needed to make some decisions and I just needed to get my shit together and I needed 15 minutes and, and, and on, and I've gone, Prior to doing some uh, speaking engagements, I've gone in there for half an hour 
there's a there's a mirror as well. I can stand there I'm by myself. I can practice my speech. Just yeah. my my nice little quiet time, which was perfect for me. Uh, people just needed some mental health breaks or having dealing with some stress. Just needed to compose themselves. Um, one one of the um, women here is pregnant. She said, "I just needed to sleep for half an hour." I just that's it. Um, but this but is this is. This is amazing. I want to pull the handbrake right here because this is tremendously important. And you you hit my heart. I've been in that space. I helped create a, a quiet room. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It wasn't wholeheartedly embraced. Why? Yeah. Because the similar things that you talk about, whether it be the the, the, the gender um, uh, gender neutral uh, bathrooms, right, or, or, or whatever the scenario is, again, the un unconscious bias is coming to say, well, fuck, I never had to deal with it. I, deal I don't give a shit what you had to deal with, folks. Yeah. I really don't care. I don't want to say that rudely. It's not that I don't care. I do care what you had to deal with. That was 10, 20, 30 years ago. We're talking about today, right? So the quiet room comes into play. And like, the, the, the old, and I'm not even bullshitting you. Like, what the fuck do I need a quiet room for? Why do I have to go spend that kind of money to go build a quiet room? First of all, it doesn't cost you anything. I mean, it, it, the cost impact is, is, is can be negligible if you do it differently. Yeah. The point is that sometimes we just need to have 10, 15, seven minutes to ourselves to say, holy smokes. I just got rocked. I need to really re recompose myself. Or I love the way you talked about. It. I've got a big meeting coming. I've got a big speech. I've got. I need to really just like you. you it, 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 if in your scenario, if the offices are all glass, you're not gonna pace back and forth. But that you know what the hell is what, what the what the hell is she up to? Like you just need to, or fuck. I got a I got a headache. You know yeah. or you know like we we had a coffee machine and like sometimes you just need to go and. Make coffee by yourself. Maybe invite somebody else into it. And go. You know what I'm really struggling with? This. Yeah. Because shit in life happens. You might just take a phone call that that, yeah. that rocked you because you found out some less than desirable news, and you don't even know how to handle it. Yeah. You can't sit. You know. You, maybe you want to go there and cry for a moment. Maybe you just want to go there and say, I, I, I need to call my mother. Hope your mother's still around. And you can call. Like, I need to call my father. I need to call somebody because I don't know how to deal with this. So anybody out there who yeah. said. And I yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. The quiet, the quiet room in construction, like we live, the construction is loud. It's distracting. It's it's swearing. We yell and scream. We think that you know, if, if you're if you're not ripping an asshole out of somebody, you're doing something wrong. Bullshit. Because you're a human being, and sometimes you just need to peel back and have quiet space. So so thanks for letting me go on to that. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, no problem. No. <laughs> That's what it's all about. It, 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 yeah. It, right. So okay. So so let's just clo close loop on this one. How has the quiet room been embraced? What's the feedback now that it's been implemented? Oh, so now, I mean, we're two years in. So now it's 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 common. People would be shocked if we didn't have one now. And and you, you can see even in our industry, it, it, there, where we were for for our, our journey in my company three years ago, I feel like the industry is just starting to to come on board. Um, and and now the more that you talk to, when you get our feedback from the from our employees about our culture that's really what you hear now it's a very positive culture because every we have the same thing the hours are really long the pay sucks there's no overtime like so we hear all those negative things those are consistent um, of things that we're trying to change but we are hearing the positive to say the culture is very positive and they don't only talk about dei they actually action it and that's really yeah. important to me because i tell people First of all, in order to be successful, you're going, to, you're going to have to have DEI. Statistically, it's proven that when you have women on your executive leadership team, you're actually more profitable than those organizations that don't. And if you have uh, gender diversity as well as um, uh, general diversity, you're actually more profitable. And that's because you get now, um, you know, just different different perspectives and different opinions. And it's difficult to make decisions when you're always, when people are always agreeing with you and not challenging you, because I, I say all the time, I make decisions really quickly, I make decisions with little information. It would be nice, I, I need for my senior leadership team, they all know when, when, when they're working with me that you have to challenge me. I think you can do that in a constructive manner, but you have to challenge me. If you don't challenge me, I'm just gonna keep moving on and then I don't want you to walk in my office one day after I said, okay, this is what we're doing and rolling your eyes and going, what the fuck is she doing? I need you to say, yeah. this doesn't make sense for these reasons. I still reserve yeah. right at the end of the day to make the decision, but I really need people that are going to, that are going to challenge me. One of the really good books I read was that Netflix rules, no, no rules. And it's not like you can apply everything that was in it. But one of the things they talk about is we set the rules because people break them. 
So why not just have conversations with those people that are breaking the rules so that we don't have to set them? So their philosophy was, you know, unlimited vacation. And it's been proven that um, people just don't take their vacation. The reason why they, if you give four weeks vacation a year, people take it is because you, you have to use it or you lose it. So now you've basically right. forced, which is, I always think people should take their vacation anyway, don't get me wrong, but it's that, it's that uh, mindset that you go, oh, I, I only have three, I, I'm, I'm tracking, I have a week left, I need to take it, otherwise I'm going to lose it. If you say, no, you have all the vacation that you want, you take what you need, then right. you're going to have to be going to abuse it because that's just the nature of who we are, but most people won't. And then what happens is you, you put the onus on the team that they're on. You're only going to take vacation if, if your team is prepared for you to be gone, because otherwise all your work is going to fall on somebody else's shoulders. And then again, if that's what's happening, it's a conversation that you have with somebody. Yes, we have unlimited vacation, which we all, we don't, um, I would love to get there. I just don't know how to implement that because it, it becomes now you really have to manage it, but I do feel that that's really wh where we should go is we should be using common sense. And for people that are breaking the rules is we have those conversations or people that aren't making good decisions. You have, you have those conversations with those individuals rather than penalizing everybody because one person has broken the rule or done something. Right. And, and this happens more times than not, right? Something happens and we, we, th we throw it out and say, everybody's abusing it. No, no silly. Let's let's actually address. It's like, you know, it's like the, the instructions. Don't put the plastic bag over your head. That it's that's like you know. Don't put the plastic bag over your head. Okay, I'm I'm surprised we have to actually write that down. But somebody sued somebody, and now this is their um, solution to say, please think about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Take some ownership. <laughs> okay, so I I really want to challenge you here because this is where it becomes fun. And I'm going to throw something at you and it, it's, it's not meant to be insulting. It's meant to be real. And it, it's, if it hasn't happened, it's going to happen. And so I want to, to paint this picture. You've got construction professionals that have been doing this for 30, 40 years, their entire lives. Okay. And yeah. somebody comes to you and says, fuck this bullshit. We don't need diversity in construction. It's working fine the way it is. You guys are all fucked. You're full of shit. How do you respond to that? I usually go back to examples um, and I go, we, I get a lot of that for the pronouns, particularly in the US, like why, why sure. does it matter? And you don't understand where, um, where our businesses are located that this isn't acceptable. And I go, this isn't about necessarily you or me, maybe it's about a family member. So if you look at, if, if you have a, a family member that, so much for my pronouns, um, that is, that wants to be referred to, uh, or that is, you know, either, either gay, let's go, let's just go with, with that. Um, and sure. you want, if, if you're not talking openly about being inclusive and things that we can do to be supportive, then it, it maybe you're not gay and I'm not gay, or maybe our team, nobody on our team is, but one of their family members is. So how do you think that they feel talking about their daughter or their son going to the softball game or the, or their graduation with their partner? Um, a partner is mm. another one that is a, is a big thing because I refer to my partner who, who, who we're actually married um as my partner and everybody thinks i'm gay or that he's my boyfriend if once they find out it's a he um and and i'm like but all i'm trying to do is be inclusive for people that aren't they that are in relationships that don't know how to refer to their mm, partners beautiful. and and it, that's all we're trying to do is just to be a little bit more inclusive and and so you don't have to follow it you're, if you're comfortable in your own skin and you want to be referred to as whatever i'm comfortable with that i i in, in the in some of the southern states they refer to you as miss so i'd be miss lisa and i've said to people privately please do not refer to me as miss lisa that i do it's not a sign of respect for me and i don't and i'm not saying that in, in your times that you would you shouldn't do that where it's appropriate then by all means do that but i have the option that it's not uh, a sign of respect for me and in fact i find that it's um it's offensive to me personally. So please don't refer to me as Miss Lisa. That's just my request. Um, and I sh should be allowed to do that. Now, I would not feel comfortable saying that to somebody if we didn't have um, DEI. And because then I would be going, no, no, this, th it's a sign of respect. So I should be, be, I should be called Miss Lisa. I should be able to accept that that's what DEI does for us. And that's what I would say. I just, when I say, to, I just talk to people. I talk, I try to educate them. I tell them our story about um, Equity 101 training. I talk about pronouns. I talk about partners. Um, I talk about now Foreman 
you know, we have to change that term to four people. And I was yeah. just at a session actually in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and I was listening to the stats. I, it was a, it was a NAWIC conference and I was listening to the stats and, and the, the gentleman's giving all the stats for women in construction, which was, which was very, very interesting. And I put my hand up and I said, can I just ask you to use the term four people instead of foreman? And you know what he said in front of a group of whatever, 400 people? Um, everybody in the survey referred to themselves as foremen, even if they were women. And I said, that doesn't matter. The change has to start somewhere. And, uh, wow. and, and then he actually changed as and he, he struggled with it, but he, he, he tried really hard. And I came up to afterwards. I said, thank you very much. That's very important. We have, it has to start somewhere. If you keep referring yeah. to people as foremen, then that's not, that's not open and inclusive. And it's not, and he goes, but it's always been that way. And I said, I understand that. Women didn't, weren't allowed to vote. Women were property of men. You know, if we never start to change, um, it will, we'll never get there. Look at what's happening in the U.S. about their, you know, their overturning Roe versus Wade. We, we'll, we're, we're just going to go backwards. So is this where we want to go? No, we want to keep moving forwards and we want to keep having these difficult conversations. And I'm not saying we have the right answer to everything, but if we don't continually challenge one another and we don't start changing these terms. So if, if you look at, um, as part of our Equity 101, we started changing, not referring to people as guys. It happens all the time. Hey guys, guys, can you do this? Guys, can you do this? It was like a, just, a, right, just right. a general thing. So we do not do that anymore. It's everybody, folks, we try to change it. And I point it out to people all the time and they're like, well, what are you talking about? Because that's, that you have to understand that that part of this is, is offensive to people. You can't just, re they're like, well, we don't mean anything by it. I understand that. But now that we know, now we change, right? It's not right. Shame, like, right? Like, like shame on us for knowing better, better and still not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, love it. Thank you. That's huge. Yeah, exactly. So now we know. So now let, let's change it. And let's, let's just, it's just words, right? And, and because you don't mean anything by it. So you're not trying to be offensive. So let's change. Now that you know, like, let's change it. And that's really what, what we, what, what I'm trying to accomplish with people is talking to people and saying, um, let's 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 start with us just our little tiny group let's just start and it's surprising now how much converse then it's you know maybe i'm bringing that conversation home to my family or you know maybe i'm bringing it out with my friends now and and i do have a group of friends that don't understand um the, completely or maybe are not completely on board and my partner i talk about this often is you can you can see you start to actually separate yourself a little bit because you're you're, sure. you're like you have to embrace it and i'm okay if you don't agree with it but you have to embrace it and you have to actually have the conversation we're never going to change everybody and i wouldn't want to As, again i think we need we, we need all four forms of opinion and i think i think that's important i just think you have to be open to listening yeah, and I think the biggest thing that you identified there is, you know, when somebody comes at you and said, okay, so uh, we don't need this, we don't want this, right? What, what, what you're, actually, you have a choice there, right? And this is where it's beautiful as a human being. You have a choice. You can, I, I'm going to use this word purposely, you can submit and sort of just like, all right, well, it's my shit I have to deal with now, right? Because words mean what words mean to us. My, the words, the way I interpret them are, could or might, may or may not be the same way that you interpret them. Instead, what you did there, what you've demonstrated is how to pivot past it to say, look, I'm going to take a true temperature reading on what's going on, right? Look at the the, the scenario you talked about. This gentleman, uh, I assume was, I think it was a gentleman, but I assume so. Um, again, my bias there leading this, talking about this, saying, okay, you know, foreman, foreman, foreman. You took a temperature reading on what's going on. Hey, this is what's actually happening. And then, again, step one, temperature reading. Now I understand what's going on. What do I want to do about it? Well, many people would just sort of submit and deal with it themselves. Instead, you do you take the next step, right? And you set the boundaries comfortably and respectfully. Here, these are the boundaries that I'd like to stay within. Can we all agree to this, right? And look at what happened. Yes, there was resistance in, and, and not negative resistance, but resistance in sort of just changing that pattern and changing the narrative and readapting. And what actually ended up occurring is beautiful, right? It's by setting those foundational boundaries. This is what's acceptable, folks. I love that. I mean, th this is true. This is right. This is what's acceptable, folks. And this is what's not, right? Right. It, 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 yeah. I love that. There's that framework too. Okay, guys, we, we do it inclusively. Like, it's okay, guys, let's take, let's, let's, let's take on this challenge, right? Well, now, you know, the trigger's off to say, okay, folks, here's what's up. 
How do we get past this? Like that little shift gives different energy, different context, different inclusiveness, right? Like we're all, we're actually all in together. It's interesting. So uh, uh, my daughter is a, uh, obviously a big, a big DI advocate. She's, you know, young in her twenties. So um, just has a much different perspective because she was, you know, educated a lot differently than, than I was. And, uh, and, and we, we talk a lot. And so, so I get a lot of advice from her. Um, but it's, we were talking one day and I was saying something, oh my God, she's such a bitch. And she said, you know, mommy, you can't say that. It's a derogatory uh, term against women. I go, that's not how I mean it. She goes, no, there's no like male equivalent to it. So if you're calling somebody a bitch, you're actually, it's a, it's, you're, you're, you're trying, to, you're, it's a degrading term. So I was like, well, that's not what I meant. So she goes, just pick another word. Like, I understand what you mean. And sometimes you can use it depends on, on the context of how you're using it. So anyway, we're, I don't know, we were joking around, we we're saying, so we came up with poo poo head. Oh my God. So I use it all the time. I'm like, oh my God, such a poo poo head. And now it's a big joke here, I, particularly in my office. Uh, one of the guys that are VP of HR, he goes, you called me a poo poo head the other day. I was like, <laughs> so, but now what it does is it just now it's caused this conversation with, with my work colleagues. And now I've brought it to their attention. And we were just in a golf tournament on Saturday. And we had the same conversation. And one of the people that was at the table said, well, it's a female dog. And I was like, yes, I understand that. But that's not what you're doing when you're calling somebody a bitch. You're not calling right. a female dog. So that's the, and you can see now they're like, because it's always been that you can tell the conversations have happened. That was always the, the excuse. Well, I'm a, I, it's a female dog. It's a word. It's a word we can use. Yeah, you can use it. You can use it in that context. It works perfectly fine. But otherwise, you, you, it's just it's offensive to women. But it's interesting, okay, so again, not having those conversations or not having those conversations. You would never know that. So just I think it's that's that's what we that, this is the evolution that we, we need to get to is to have these kinds of conversations because you don't realize uh that what your what the impact of your words are because that's not how you mean it yeah look you just eliminated something for me i i, I love that you chose a word poo poo head which d yeah. did two different things it connected us it 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 shed light on the scenario but it also illuminated maybe i am being a dickhead right like whatever that is i don't know i just use that word for the, for the came in, right if, if if you said oh well you know that person is such a bitch it, the easiest thing to do is armor armor up and be ah you know like fuck off, leave me alone, right? But instead, now you're saying, oh, you're a poo, poo head and you walk away from that and you're like, what did I do there to create that scenario, right? Yes. First of all, it's sort of, it, it, it's, it's lighthearted and it's like, look, if somebody calls you on your shit, sometimes you need to listen, yes. right? And, 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 and analyze it and like, is it true? And if it's true, what can I learn from it? And if it's not true, then I'm just going to dismiss it and move on and not, not become attached to it. Yes. Right. So there's something like, look at, look at the power of our words and power of our language. Yes. This is cool. Like, like, so you've talked about a whole bunch of different things and it's pretty magical. I, I want to know what do you do specifically? Like if you could sort of eliminate that for our audience out there and say, okay, folks, here's what, you know, here's what, <clears throat> excuse me, what Lisa does. How do you connect with people? What do you truly do to connect with people? Um, I, 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 my, my, I'm my authentic self. Um, when I when I got into this role, I was actually I went from finance into the operations. So I was the executive vice president, and uh, it was a place where I didn't fit uh, initially. And so I tried to be what everybody else wanted me to be. So I tried to be the you know the funny woman, the the weak woman, the I, I, everything. I, I tried what I what what I was because I was getting all this negative feedback, um, and so. And obviously that didn't work as you can imagine, but, but th that's when, and I actually got it. I was, I was lucky enough to get a leadership coach and she was the one to have me look at myself and what was important to me for my core values. So now what I, and, and I, and that was eye opening for me to understand that I'm not going to be successful in an organization that's not aligned to what my core values are and to understand also that my words and my body language have impact on people, regardless of uh, if, if I think that they don't. And, and I'll go back to um, one of my early days, one of our work, and this was a, a gentleman who worked for me um, and he had OCD and we, and I didn't know it at the time, um, but mm -hmm. so we, you knew that he, he always had his desk really clean and everything was like lined up perfectly. And so we used to go in at night as a joke and like 
take the stapler and put staples on his desk and move his post-it notes around. And, and he was very, he, you know, he, he'd laugh about it the next day. He was very engaging, thought, so the, here's your unconscious bias. I thought he thought it was funny because he was laughing with us. Sure. And then when we go to the Equity 101 training, you understand, like, what the fuck was I doing? Like, how, how inappropriate was that? But, and part of that was he did, he never said anything. And I apologized to him and he appreciated that. But I said, at some mm. point, you know, you, you, you need to actually say this is not appropriate. And obviously he didn't feel like he was in a safe space to be able to do that, which was another thing that we learned that in order yeah. for you to get this uh, feedback, you have to offer a psychologically safe space for people um, because Thank otherwise you. you'll never get, the, you'll never get the feedback. And so that's, so all of those things I've, I've learned. So now when I approach people, I'm my authentic self. I try to be unapologetic. I try to be, um, you know, not in your face because I know that I'm very intimidating. I, I don't feel that way. And if you talk to my kids, I'll say, say the same thing, but I do understand now that um, I, I, one, because of my position, two, because of, I think the passion that I speak with, um, and, and I really, I don't like bullshit. So, so I'll call you up pretty quickly. Um, yeah. but I try, I try to be my authentic self and that's what I think resonates with people. I'm also, um, I'm, I'm passionate. I'm empathetic. Um, I believe in people. I really want my team to succeed. Um, that's very, very important to me. And I think that that comes across. So when you meet me, I'm about what can I do to, to help you succeed? And I say when people aren't, when our managers are not successful, I say the first thing we have to look at is, is did we give them, did we support them? Did we give them the tools to do the job? Did they have the resources? Did we look at their personal situation? Did they need, you know, because sometimes you bring that into the workplace. Um, we just have to be a little bit more open and give people the opportunity to figure out how they need to get things in line. And then I, my, then I say, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Maybe our, my my company's vision um, and mission doesn't lie, align with you, but don't make me pay for that. <laughs> Just leave. Yeah. Like at some point, find another job. Let's have a, let's have an open conversation to say, you know, I don't think this is working for me. I'd like a transition. I, I need six months to find another job. I would be supportive of that as long as you're continually doing your job and you're not um, you're not negatively impacting the team. What happens to people I find is once you've made the decision to move on. You, you, you come and I'm, and I, I'm generalizing, but you, I always say you have one foot out. You don't care anymore. So you don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. And now you're, it's all about you. So that's why I think it's, some, I, that's why I think we, you know, I like to be open and honest to have people tell me, you know, at least three months before they want to leave. But I also understand it causes issues and then you get cut off from, you know, because security and it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to do that transition. So we talk, that, thank that you. Be, no problem. And you talked about a, a bunch of fundamental things. Number one is, again, there's the boundaries that came back up. Hey, folks, like this is the boundaries that we're setting. This is what's cool. When you talk about the stapler scenario, you know, here's the, let's set the boundaries. Let's have fun within the context of this boundary. And that occurs after their psychological safety. This is one of the you know misunderstood things. Like if if, if there's no psychological safety, in it, I'm not going to feel you know safe and secure and, and know that what I have to say matters, then I'm not going to say shit. So you have to set that sort of foundation in place. You know, and I want to come back to there's there's two things that sort of intertwine for me, and again, these are the lenses through I see through I see life with the lenses which I see through whatever you get what I'm talking about here. But what I'm saying is, you talked about um, a, a point in your life where you were going through, and what did you do? You leaned into the experts, right? You know, we yeah. talked. You, you mentioned earlier about oh the the, the old adage of blaze your own trail. I'm going to say it's bullshit, right? Oh, I did it this way. So this person should have to, you know, grind it out the same way. Not true. Like surround yourself with great people, be in the right space. And what did you, you know, you talk about the power of a coach here. Hey, look, I don't know it all. I got a coach. I got a, you know, I got somebody who's going to, you also talk about sponsorship or like somebody who's in your corner blindly, A, to call you on your shit, B, to help you get better so that you can, they can see the things that the, the, the person you can become. Like, this is it. This is why you lean into and, coaches. And I think the thing with the coach is that they're independent and they're objective. So they don't have yeah. the emotional uh, baggage that you have within your organization. So although you can have, um, you know, a confidant in your organization, they still, they, you know, everyone's everyone's still, at the end of the day, you're still looking out for your your best interest. I mean, the last thing you want to do, because that's that's what everyone worries about is getting fired. And, uh, and, I, and I say that anybody on my team, you will never be blindsided. You will know I will try my damnedest to 
to Beautiful. change whatever it is that's happening. You know, we've invested in you. We've trained you. You're part of the team. I don't want to lose you. I also don't expect people to sign on for life. I've never expected that. Our, our, our hope is that, you know, we can get you to this level and that you take it someplace else. And then you start to grow teams and, and yes. you apply those skills so that we can actually continue that on. And then we can bring new people up. Because that's the other problem that everyone has is, you know, you don't want to stay in these positions for for life, which is what happens to a lot of people. You want to go in, make your difference and then grow to somewhere um, somewhere else. And the other thing is then maybe come back, get yeah. some other experience. I say the same thing with teachers. You know, it should be, you know, they have this um, it's like a, a five and three or whatever it is. So you work um, you, you work longer hours and then you can get this one year spa uh, paid sabbatical and i think everybody should particularly in the education system i think you should be re required to do that and then do something for the year that's within your um your sector or whatever it is that so gives you some professional development so you get out into the real world to see what things are like what people need what skill sets they need um you know what kind of things that they're struggling with because otherwise you're in this you know education community and you don't actually get outside of it and then you're, you're not actually in industry to say this is really what we need um these are the skills that we need people to have in order for us to be successful in our businesses i'm jumping up and down just saying that there's a holistic approach right this is where it comes full circle right hey what do i know what am i missing and if i'm incubated within the same space all the time i'm not going to catch all that yeah, exactly. right so how do you grow as a human being introduce different things right so um <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the Canadian Association of, uh, of Women in Construction, because this is really cool. And I want to sort of just pivot back here briefly. So tell us a little bit about that. How do we how do we get involved? How do we support it? Sort of who's it for? Yeah, so it was actually formed. Uh, it, it has an interesting um, story behind it. And it was formed um, out of the this National Women in Construction that was based in the U.S. So we were one of the first um, affiliate members. And what we're trying to do is have this national voice. Now it is based mainly in Ontario. So one of my uh, mandates is to have uh, a national voice because obviously the West has a, a very big part to play in women in construction. And I think that we need to work together. So we're trying to do this unified voice, get industry together, the unions, a government, um, and associations like ourselves to be able to promote uh, women in construction and look at all of the issues that we face. Again, I think I spoke about that a little bit earlier about uh, pay equity, job title equity, um, access to child care, um, and, and mm, access okay. to, you know, either paid uh, apprenticeships in order for us to be able to um, fill this void in, in the, this labor gap that we're going to have within the next five to 10 years. Um, so yeah, it, we would welcome any um, members or volunteers that would, that would be uh, willing to help out. The website's the best place to go, which is at kwic.ca. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. That's another great way. We're on LinkedIn and Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, yeah, participate. I think it's awesome. You can do an individual membership or corporate memberships. Allows you to vote and uh, get involved in some of our committees. Um, so yeah, it'd be awesome. So we can we can blaze these trails together. Cool. And it's open to both women and men. Thank you. And that's the, yeah, and that's the whole thing. That's what it's about, folks. Is is like do, doing this all together. We got to get out of these silos where we we must accomplish things ourselves. No, it sucks. It's heavy. It's it's dehabilitating. It's 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 exhausting. So, okay, a couple of fun questions. Um, what's a well? This is not really a fun question, but this is a, a thought provoking question. What's a big misconception about women in in construction that you'd like to debunk? Uh, we're not all poo poo heads. <laughs> 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 I love that. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the thing. We're not all these strong, um, you know, we, you know, we get, I get a lot, uh, my credibility suffers because I didn't, you know, run a crew or didn't run the, the piece of equipment or I don't know how to, how to use the piece of equipment. And, and, and honestly, no, I'm talking about women in leadership, you know, to be in these positions, sure. you don't have to, you don't have to have run a crew and you don't have to, uh, know how to run all the equipment. It's a different skill set that's required. So, um, and I know that gets thrown out quite quite a bit, um, particularly for people in my position, that they feel like that's the that's how you would define how you're qualified to do the job. So that's really what I'd like to change. Is is it's it really is a different skill set to to be running a business at this level. 
So you don't even have to be from the industry. I don't think you need to be uh, from construction to be able to run a construction company. You have to have good people yeah. that are going to run your crews and understand what the business is. But when you're running a business, it's it's a you're running a business regardless of the industry that you're in. Thank you for that. That, that, was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Now, if you could travel back in time and give your past self advice for the future, what would you say? I would have learned to golf. And I, and I, <laughs> I get a lot. I'll tell you, a lot of stuff gets done on the golf course. And this has been a real, I tell everybody this. Um, I took up golf during COVID because it was the only thing that we could do. And uh, my partner golfs as well. Um, and um, mm -hmm. the amount of opportunities that I've been afforded because one, I actually enjoy it. It's a game against yourself, which is awesome. It's very humbling. You can hit this great yeah. shot, feel like you should be on tour, and then you, you know, tank it in the water or in the bush the next shot. So I, I really like that. And I, I, and I actually say sometimes it's like building a team. Sometimes your team's like, yes, we're ready to go. And their team's like, oh my God, what do I do? How did, how did we get here? Um, but what happens is you get, particularly in construction, there's all kinds of golf tournaments. And I've been out there and women, um, they, they don't golf or they only do it in tournaments. And the first thing that happens is they say, I'm not very good, you know, and then they, they, maybe it's a bad shot. And then what happens is the, you're equal and all of a sudden now you're the inferior person. And the guys start to say, here, I'll show you how to golf, hold the ball, you know, hold the club like this, do this. And now you've lost that advantage that you're an equal, which is quite interesting. And it happens, it's all, uh, it's all unconscious bias. It's not intentional. Uh, it's just the way that rolls out. So, so all I tell people is just be confident. You don't have to be a great golfer. You just have to be confident. Go out there, hit that shot. They're all about, no one's, no one's good. We all work for a living. Nobody, none of us are on tour, but you're confident and it, it will, oh, sorry, it will allow you to, um, to, or you'll just get invited out. And now to, to one of the, you know, they want to take three, uh, one person wants to take three other people out. It's a whole day or together between four, four and a half hours. Usually you do lunch afterwards, um, or maybe it's an afternoon and you do dinner. You get to spend all this time with decision makers. Why wouldn't you want to do it? You just need to be confident and you, and you also want to even this playing field. So if I could have done anything, that's what I would have done. Uh, and I know it sounds really silly, but it really gives you an upper hand all over the place. It's, it's amazing. I've been invited to the pro-am now. Everyone's there. I can't believe you went. So I would not have had the, and I'm not a good golfer at all. Um, I don't have a handicap. I don't, I work too much to be a good golfer, but I'm confident that I'm going to go. And honestly, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy this. This is going to be a once in a lifetime experience that I'm never going to have again. I'll never get invited back. Um, this would be, this is just awesome. And I would never have done that if I didn't actually take that up. My gosh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Like, I would have never thought of that, right? And the way you sort of unpack that is the way everything happens there, right? Yeah, okay, sure. You know, yes, you get business, but more importantly, you again, you're setting the boundaries. Hey, uh, we're we're equal here, right? And if you don't, then subconsciously, you know what 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 happens. But and most importantly, you're connecting with human beings, right? You're connecting. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been magical i'm i'm i appreciate you i truly appreciate this whole conversation uh you know our, our, our audience out there folks this is this is real this is raw this is authentic this is what we're talking about um everything here is, is changing like construction doesn't have to be the way it's always been we're changing the narrative we're flipping the script lisa an honor to share space with you thank you thank you thank you thanks how do people get in touch with you LinkedIn is the best way I say. Yeah, LinkedIn's the best way I say. Uh, I I I I, uh, I truly connect with everybody. When I was part of my journey, that's one of the things I looked at is how do I connect with other women. Um, so if truly, if you're a woman in in construction or in leadership, and some, I will I will definitely accept the uh, the invite. I, I do it all the time. So that's I'm I'm here I'm here to support and sponsor any women that want to, um, and anybody for that matter. But obviously, my passion is women to get us. Uh, a little bit more in, in into these leadership roles in any industry. It's beautiful. Thanks for making time. This has been great. I appreciate you and we will stay connected. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. It's been very, very nice. And thank you. Appreciate it.